In this video, I'm just going to give a demonstration of how to use the Behavior Analytics plugin for Moodle. Uh, as a regular teacher user here, uh, we'll see that we have the Behavior Graph or the Behavior Analytics block installed here, and it's got four links. The first one is the documentation, which will just give an overview of what the, the plugin is and how to use its various features and functions. Now the first step is to configure the resource nodes. So if we click on that link, it'll bring up the configuration interface. And what we see here is a graph of all the resource nodes or modules in the course. And these uh, align with anything in a Moodle course here like this where we have a link with an icon beside it. So any of these here all of these, these are all considered modules or resource nodes. So from this interface here, uh, we have the graph of all the nodes. They're color-coded based on their type, and they're grouped by section. And hovering the mouse over one of these will bring up its name. And these black ones are all just section nodes. They don't really uh, pertain to anything directly in the course. They're just there to, to group the other nodes. And hovering over a regular resource node will bring up its name along with a little preview that we can even interact with and see exactly what that, that resource is. Uh, so there's also a hierarchical legend here. We have all the course sections and all the resource nodes as well. Uh, so we have a page, URLs, forums, this kind of thing. And they're all listed here and here as well. So we can add or remove anything here or add them back. And there's a couple of ways to do that. Uh, let's just put link weight at zero so that the nodes don't move around. And then we can remove a whole section or bring it back. Move an individual resource within a section or bring it back. And we can also remove things by right clicking. And then I'll bring up this little hide thing. Click to make it go away or do it like that as well. So that took out all of our assignments, section three, and bring them back just like that. So once you figure out what we want on screen, uh, then it's a matter of actually positioning it. Uh, so our links weight slider here, which we moved to zero before so that nothing will move around. Now if we click and drag a node, it runs a physics engine, but uh, right now nothing's moving around because the link weight is at zero. So if we, for instance, move the link weight to minus two, that'll actually expand everything and start to add more space in between the nodes. And if we want to add a positive link weight, we can click and drag to get the physics running and it'll compress everything. And what this is useful for is, uh, say we want to move the whole uh, group of assignments. So we'll give it some link weight, we can take the section node for that and we can drag all of those resource nodes together to over to one spot. And then once we got them approximately where we want them, something like that or whatever, and then put the link weight back to zero. And we can move individual nodes here and there and whatever, and the rest of them don't move around. And then sometimes if we take a whole bunch out and put them back, we can end up with a bit of a messy graph. Uh, so one thing again we can do is put a bunch of link weight on there, take the section node and we can pull those out and rearrange things a little bit. And again, things are too, too compressed, we can put a negative weight on them and expand everything and just get a little bit more space. And so that's basically the basics of how to configure the resource nodes. Once we have everything positioned the way we want it, we'll call that good. Then what we can do is go to View Student Behavior. And this will get the, <coughs> the viewing and clustering stage here. So with this interface, again, what we see is the graph that we just finished configuring. Uh, we can get previews by hovering over a node. We can't move the nodes at all anymore. They're now statically positioned. And along the bottom here we have a time slider and this will just show a different time slice 
of the of the log data. On the left here, we have a student menu. If you can click on student zero, for instance, this will bring up all their their click data for that particular student for this particular slime slice. So if we take the time slice, move it all the way like this. What we're seeing here is the very first link that the student made. And you have the first and the second, first and third, first through fifth, first through hundredth, first through whatever. So we can view the beginning, we can view what the student did kind of in the middle of the course. The student doesn't have any data out this far. Let's see. That student does. So we can you know view a section, kind of what they were doing in the middle, what they were doing towards the end. And whatever. So once we have a time slice and we figured out what students we want to be looking at, then we can go ahead and hit the cluster button. And this will bring up the clustering interface. So the same graph is shown, but now each student is uh, marked as with their centroid. So each triangle represents a student centroid. Hovering over that will show us which student it is. There's two different types of centroids we can use. The default is to use a decomposed centroid. And we can see here that each student centroid is perfectly aligned on a resource node. If we use geometric centroids, then they, we just get a weighted geometric uh, from all the, the nodes that they clicked on. So decomposed centroids, we can wind up with overlap students if both students have uh, a centroid point that's the same node. Uh, with geometric centroids, that's the only way that happens is if they have they've clicked on the exact same resources the same number of times. Once we figure out which uh, type of centroids we want to use, uh, this slider here controls the actual clustering features. And the first thing to do, remove the graph, scale everything out to use the full screen space. In the third position here on the slider, we can actually run clustering. So if we enter the number of clusters that we want, maybe four or five, uh, defaults to three if we don't enter anything. And we can step through the clustering uh, one iteration at a time, or hit the play button and it'll just run to conversions. Anytime you can pause that, go back to stepping, whatever. Uh, it's also possible during this stage, if uh, the clustering results aren't quite looking the way they're supposed to, uh, we can take an drag a student centroid to a cluster and that'll put it in the clustering centroid that we drop it closest to. And that feature is just to assist the, the clustering in case it doesn't seem to be doing what it looks like it should be doing, clustering the way we think it should be clustering. As we saw there before, hovering over a student centroid uh, at this stage of the clustering will bring up that particular student's behavior graph. And if we hover over a clustering centroid, we will get the common links of all the students in that cluster. In this case, it's just one, so the graphs are exactly the same. And just to get rid of that, we can just click outside of it. We can see there that this cluster, there's just a couple of common links. Uh, when we bring up this graph, again, we can get the preview from hovering over a node, or we can hover over the link and get previews of both resources that were involved in the making of that link. Uh, our clustering results are all getting logged on the log panel here. Number of students we have, number of clusters, what iteration are on, distance to the clusters and the cluster members. And one other thing we can do uh, at this stage of the clustering is to add comments. So if we want to comment something about this student, we can just click on it, it'll bring up a text box. We can say, comment about student. And same thing with the clustering centroid, if you want to make a comment or annotate the cluster itself. Just say, maybe there's two members in this cluster, something like that. And we'll let that run to convergence. And if we hit the stop button here, that resets everything. And we can start all over again, change our centroids, run our clustering around with different clusters or whatever. And the graph button will take us back to uh, the graphing stage and we can again choose a different student or a different time slice, whatever. Our log panel results can be copied and pasted somewhere else or printed out to a file or sent to the printer.
And so once we've got some clustering results made, uh, we can go on to the next stage, which is the replay. What we have in here is the replay interface, the same log panel that we saw in the clustering. We can copy and print out the results. Here now we have uh, all of our clustering runs. So they're numbered by uh, the user ID, and then the graph configuration, and then the actual clustering run. So we don't have uh, much data here, but we can click on that and we can control, we can view the replay, step through it one step at a time, forward or back, or we can just play it and watch it, watch it run. And so that's where yeah, the end of it is. And again, you know, we can hover over the centroids and we get their their graphs. We can click, we can see the comments we had before, we can change them. And during this stage as well, uh, in the event that uh, new data is added and these centroids all get changed, during the background clustering when new data is added. We can take and manually cluster again, say we want to do that. And it brings up essentially two sets of clustering where we have the darker original k-means clustering results and the more transparent manual clustering results. And this can just uh, allow us to see sometimes the original clustering results maybe don't look as good later on and we can adjust them and say this student should be here and that student should be in this cluster and whatnot. Uh, so that's the basics of the of the cluster replay. And so I've uh, now logged in as a different user here. I've got a bit of a different cluster run. I just want to show what happens when we get new student data in the background. So Sorry, here was our original convergence that we ran in the clustering results. And then I imported uh, another log file, added a bunch of data, which changed all the student centroids. So it all got updated in the background. So when we see the next iteration, all the students have moved around to account for all their, their new data. I decided that this student should actually be in this cluster, so I introduced some manual clustering results. Uh, and then the students made some more data. And so in the next iteration, we see a student moving again, and it stays with uh, its original manual clustering results, and it's also now included in this uh, regular clustering cluster as well. It just shows that the manual clustering members all stay the same, uh, in the, even when the, the data is all updated in the background.